Greetings everyone, my name is Dr. Deborah and I'm here to discuss a variety of biblical topics. My smile is different today, but I am still smiling. I will be discussing 12 black tribes in the Holy Bible. There are so many black tribes in the Bible, I had to limit myself to discussing only 12. They are the Egyptians, Philistines, the Syrians, Babylonians, Akkadians, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Sidon, the Ethiopians, the Ishmaelites, also known as the Arabians, Keturah's sons, who are also known as Arabians, and the Edomites. Amen. In part three today, we'll discuss the Egyptians, the Philistines, and the Assyrians. Let's get busy. Before we discuss the black tribes, let me show you how to tell who the black tribes are in the Holy Bible. All black people are descended from Ham, who may be the first black man in the Holy Bible. Tribes of Hamites, also known as black men, ruled the civilized world during the Old Testament. In case you don't wish to take my word on this fact, let's see what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about Ham, whom they call Sham. All right. The natives and tribes which descent from Cham are enumerated in Genesis 10, 6 through 20. They are divided into four great families, Chus, Mesram, Futh, and Chanan. The Cushites are found in the valleys of the Euphrates and Tites, Tigris in Arabia and also in Africa. Mizraim is Egypt, Futh, less known seems to have occupied regions west of Egypt, particularly Libya. Chaman comprised the numerous tribes whose country was subsequently occupied by Israel. The Chamites were consequently spread over an immense extent of territory. They founded the greatest empires of antiquity, Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, Phoenicia. All right. That's what the Catholics know about black people. Thus, even though the Catholics know black men ruled the world during the Old Testament, they still depicted and continue to depict these black Hamitic tribes as Europeans or white men in the Bible and in their history books. The Protestants, Western academia, Hollywood, and all white media still follow in the Catholic Church's footsteps by depicting these black Hamitic tribes as white men to this day. Right now, it's time for the truth to prevail. As black people, we tend to assume racist white people don't know the truth, and we wear ourselves out explaining ourselves to them. As I have shown you, racist Gentiles do know the truth. That is why they lie. In this video, my purpose is to briefly reveal what the Holy Bible says about three black tribes, but please know there are so many more black tribes in the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible begins with the book of Genesis, which was written by the patriarch Moses after he left Egypt. Let's find the Egyptians on this chart. Black men were the first tribe in the human family to live in cities as listed in Genesis 10. To live in cities means to be civilized. Thus, black men were the first tribe to not only be civilized, but also to civilize other tribes, namely white people or Gentiles, who had zero cities in Genesis 10. If you would like more information or more details, please see my video titled The Secret Biblical Fact Why White People Enslaved Black People. Before he left Egypt, the patriarch Moses was taught to read and write the Egyptian language we call Hebrew, and he was taught by the Egyptians, who had learned it from another black tribe called the Canaanites. The Egyptians were so brilliant that to this day, white people's museums highly value the wonderful items and treasures made by these black people who lived in the desert of Africa. Though the Egyptians ruled the world for thousands of years, all, that, all of that came to an end after God put a curse on the Egyptians and told them 
they would no longer dominate the other civilized nations. And here we see the curse. Ezekiel 29, 14, and 15. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return unto the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall no more rule over the nations. After the Egyptians were conquered by the black Babylonians, God destroyed the Babylonians when the captivity of the Jews ended during the Old Testament. Since that time, the people of the north, specifically the white Greeks and then the white Romans, ruled over the Egyptians. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the wheat-colored Arabs, who do their best to claim Egypt's former glory as their own, began to rule over the black Egyptians and continue to do so to this day. Why did God put a curse on the Egyptians? The Egyptians were cursed because of their pride. They could do acts no other tribe on earth could carry out. Not only were they able to build pyramids that no one can replicate to this day, they were also able to turn inanimate objects into living beings. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall seek unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. No other tribe has affected human civilizations such as the unique black Egyptians whose artifacts we still treasure today and admire. When I visited Egypt in 2019, my tour guide kept saying, there is a little bit of Egypt in every culture. As an example, do you have tile in your bathrooms? If so, that's because the Egyptians had tile in their bathrooms thousands of years before white people became civilized. The Egyptian Egyptians dominated the people of the earth like no other tribe during the Old Testament and still influence us to this day. Yet the original black Egyptians remain in Egypt. They resemble the African American inhabitants of major American cities. I took this picture of Egyptian children singing in church in 2019. As you see, they do resemble black Americans, don't they? The next black tribe we'll discuss is the Philistines, who, like the Egyptians, are descended from Ham's son, Mizraim. When you look up the Philistines or Philistines in books written by racist theologians, they will tell you that the Philistines are Aryans who biblically are brown-skinned Persians or Indo-Europeans. They are neither. The Holy Bible states the Philistines are descended from Mizraim, a son of Ham. Thus, they are black Hamites. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lahabim, and Nephtuhim, and Pathrusim, and Casluhim, out of whom came Philistim. And that's the uh, name in Genesis for the Philistines and Kaphtorim. So you see the Philistines come from Mizraim, a son of Ham. Amen. Sometimes referred to as Philistines, the black Philistines, which means rollers, lived in the land of Philistia, or as we say, the Greek version of Philistia, which is Palestine. Their land was on the border of the land of Israel, but they inhabited areas of Canaan too, 
even though the Philistines were not Canaanites. The Philistines were a superstitious and warlike tribe who controlled the sea. They smelted iron in furnaces, forged iron, used iron rim chariots, and had iron swords. As I have stated in other videos, black men were the first men on the planet to use iron after the Great Flood. The term blacksmith refers to the first black men in Europe who created iron objects for white people. In addition to Delilah, who is the most famous Philistine woman, we have Goliath, who is the most famous Philistine man. Goliath was wearing iron when he confronted the Jews in 1 Samuel 17, 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. I guess you know how that conflict with David ended. I guess you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> However, the Philistines were not just warriors and blacksmiths. They also practiced voodoo and soothsaying, according to Isaiah 2 and 6. The relationship of this black tribe with the Jews did not begin with Goliath versus David. It actually began with Abraham, who peacefully lived among the Philistines in Genesis 21 and 34. In the book of Judges, the judge Samson first married a black Philistine woman who was later killed by the Philistines. After a big fight, Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey in Judges 15 and 16. After Samson met Delilah, the situation went downhill, and Samson ended up as a blind captive of the Philistines. Still, Samson killed more Philistines at his death than during his lifetime. The Philistines remained a rowdy bunch who actually stole the revered Ark of the Covenant from the Jews. These black people were the only people on the planet who actually took the Ark from the Jews in 1 Samuel, and some of them even looked into the Ark. Israel had been fighting against the black Philistines, but the Jews had already lost 4,000 men. Because the Philistines brought their idols with them into battle, some Jew had the bright idea to bring the Ark of the Covenant along with Eli the priest, two wayward sons, onto the battlefield. And this is what happened. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man unto his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen, and the ark of God was taken. Of course, the priests, two ungodly sons, were killed. And what did the black Philistines do with the Ark of the Covenant? 
They took it into the temple of their black god, Dagon, who was a merman. Whenever you buy a cup of coffee from a nationally known chain, you'll see a drawing of Shalash, who is Dagon's mermaid wife, but she will be white instead of black like her husband, Dagon. I know they'll say she's a siren, but like everything else racist white people claim, Shalash started off as a black mermaid lady. Let's see what happened when the ark was installed in the temple of the idol Dagon. And the Philistines took the ark and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. That was an idol. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left remaining to him. Oh, man. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. An emerald is a tumor or a big nasty bump. So they were full of big nasty bumps, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. Oh my. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the God let the ark of the God of Israel be carried unto Gath. So they sent it to some other Philistines. <laughs> and they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds, big nasty bumps, in their secret parts. Oh, my. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. Okay, so they're moving this dangerous, destructive art around to different groups of Philistines. And it came to pass as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there, and the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Either they were dead, or they had big nasty bumps in their private parts. Oh my. The Ark of the Covenant was in possession of the black Philistines for seven months, according to 1 Samuel 6 and 1. Meanwhile, many of these black people were overrun by mice, by more men dying, or they were afflicted with big nasty bumps in their genital area. Thus, all five lords of the black Philistines got together and decided to ask their sorcerers and diviners what to do. The witch doctors told them to send the ark back, but with a trespass offering of golden mice and golden emeralds, also known as tumors, plus jewels of gold, because the Philistines were rich. And maybe 
the God of Israel would take his hand off the Philistines. The doctors advised them to put the ark on a new cart with two milk cows. These are cows that are bred to produce milk. If the cows go by Beth Shemesh, which means house of the sun, which was the exact location where the black Philistines looked into the ark, that means God accepts the offering. If the cows go any other way, this whole situation is a matter of happenstance or coincidence. The Philistines obeyed their doctors, and the cows went directly by Beth Shemesh, a town in which God killed over 50,000 men as the immediate result of uh, their looking into the ark. The men of Beth Shemesh notified the Jews that the ark was on its way back to them. The Jews then returned the Ark of the Covenant to Eleazar the priest, thus the last human being to look into the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, was a black Philistine. And after he did that, yep, he died. Amen. Our next black tribe in the Holy Bible is the Assyrians, who are descended from Asher. Though the name Asher means black, Asher was a Shemite, and specifically the second son of Shem. This is as far as racist theologians wish to go. Thus, they label Assyrians and Babylonians as Shemites, which they are not. What black Asher did was leave his Shemite family, which had only one city, and then Asher joined the Hamites, who were busy building multiple cities. The Bible records 16 Hamitic cities in the 10th chapter of Genesis. As usual, the Hamites had it going on. As we talk about Asher, we must discuss Nimrod of Cush, descended from Ham. So it starts off, the children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So Asher was born as a Shemite. However, when we look under the sons of Ham, which starts off, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phud, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rama, and Sabteca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. We have to keep going. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod was also the first human king. How do we know? Because, and the beginning of his kingdom, kings have kingdoms. And the first kingdom was the kingdom of Nimrod, who was the first king was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Shinar is Babylon. So we see Babylon is listed under Ham. Out of that land, out of Babylon, went forth Asher. Okay, and all the Assyrians come from Asher and builded Nineveh. Now we're going to come back to Nineveh. And the city Rehoboth and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. The same is a great city. Amen. Thus, because Asher left the Shemites and joined the Hamites, his descendants were the black Assyrians who became Hamites, not Shemites. It seems racist theologians are afraid that if Hamitic people learn of our great biblical heritage, we might start dominating the world again. Hmm. Like the Egyptians and the Philistines, the Holy Bible contains hundreds of references to the Hamitic Assyrians. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians dominated the ancient world during the Old Testament. Even Western history records the most famous black Assyrian king whose name was Hammurabi. He created a code of civil laws which are studied by white people down to this day. 
After the 12 tribes of Israel split into the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah versus the 10 tribes who were also known as the Black Samaritans because these Jews had intermarried with the indigenous Black Canaanites, the Black Assyrians kept kidnapping the Samaritans while simultaneously moving into their land. The scriptures record an Assyrian solution to a Jewish problem in 2 Kings 17. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, uh, he was the 14th king of uh, Israel. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel. Now, Israel here means the Samaritans, also known as the Ten Tribes, carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon. Now, all of these uh, places are Hamitic cities. And from Kutha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Savarvam, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children Israel, and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. What was the Assyrian king's solution to the problem of the hungry lions? Where, uh, wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded and said, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. Thus, the result was a big religious mess of confusion. And the men of Babylon made Sukkoth Benath. So they were making these idols uh, that had originated with the tribe where they had come from in Assyria. And the men of Cuth made Nergal, that was their god. And the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartan. And the Sepharvites burnt their children in fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from this. Still, according to the Holy Bible, the black Assyrians were also the people of Nineveh in Genesis 10. So let's review that. Okay. So we, we've read this already, and we see in uh, Cush, who's one of the sons of Ham, and we see Asher coming from Shem, and but staying with the Hamites, and we see the city that Asher built was called Nineveh, which means Nineveh was full of black Assyrians. Amen. Why is that important? It's important because some of us have been taught that the Old Testament in the Holy Bible is directed only to the brown-skinned Jews. If that statement is correct, why did God send the Jewish prophet Jonah to Nineveh? a city full of black Assyrians during the Old Testament. Now, in some of my other videos, I called Jonah a racist because he did not want to deliver God's word to a bunch of black people. Let's see what the Bible says in Jonah 1 and 1. 
Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now Jonah means dove, and Amittai, his father, his name means truth. Saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Okay. So how do I know Jonah went to Tarshish because it was full of white people? Because. Okay. These are the generations of the sons of Noah who are Shem, Ham, and Japheth unto them were the sons born after the flood. Now, the sons of Japheth were who we call white people. Gomer, that's Germany, and Magog and Madai, those are the Medes, and today the Medes are called the Kurds, and Yavon, that's Greece, and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, that's the father of the Ashkenazi Jews, and Ripheth and Togarmah, and the sons of Yavon, again, that's Greece, Elisha, and who? Tarshish. Okay. So, ancient people often named cities after a patriarch. So, Jonah knew that if he went to Tarshish, and if you want to see that one more time, here we go. He went to Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. Yes because it was full of white people. And he thought that he would be far from the presence of God if he got away from those black people. Let's see how it worked out for him. However, as mom used to say, Jonah had another thought coming. So the Lord sent out a great wind unto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners, that's what the sailors were called, were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares. Those were the objects that they had bought to, be, uh, to sell that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God would think upon us that we perish not. And they said to every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. To make a short story even shorter, because the book of Jonah only has four chapters, now Jonah decides to tell the entire truth about himself. He had already told the men he was fleeing from the presence of God, but now he specified that he was a Hebrew running from the creator of, <coughs> excuse me, sea and dry land. Meanwhile, the ship... continue to rock on the violent waves and is jolted under the mighty wind. Jonah tells them to throw him into the sea, but they really don't want to do that. They try rowing to shore, but no progress is made. So the mariners beg God not to punish them for throwing Jonah overboard. Then they do just that. Instantly, the sea is calm which scares the stuffing out of the men who offer sacrifices and vows to God. When you're not saved, but God answers your prayer, it is truly terrifying, especially when you are living a sinful life. God has something for Jonah, specifically a huge fish, which is not ever identified in the original languages of the Bible as well. Thus, hard-headed racist Jonah sits in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights. 
Finally, Jonah prays to God and mentions the weeds wrapped around his head. He repents and God has the big fish vomit Jonah onto dry land. God repeats his directions to Jonah. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey. Jonah was running really fast. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, what did those black Assyrians living in Nineveh do when they heard the preaching of the brown-skinned racist Noah, Jonah? So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, Sackcloth is a really rough, cheap cloth that is used for, um, like, burlap. From uh, the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him. Since he was a king, you know, he had an elegant, sharp robe. But he took it off. And covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Now, when these black people fasted, not only did they fast, without food or without water, they also made their animals fast. Now you have to eat the animals, right, to stay alive. But they had the animals fasting. So that they had a fast that was even more extreme than the Jews had because you never see in the Bible the Jews having their animals fast. But these black people did it, okay? And that's another way you know that these are black people because Baby, sometimes we are all the way live. Amen. Okay. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Not only were there beasts fasting, but they put sackcloth on the beast, and the beast don't even wear clothes. Okay. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now you would think that after all this, Jonah would be meek and humble, but no, that brown skin racist Jonah still had that foul attitude, and he was very angry to the point of talking suicide. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, if Jonah had wanted to die, he'd have crawled on back up in that fish after he vomited him out, but he didn't do that any. He was just talking a lot of junk, okay? Jonah was just talking junk. So if you want the details, read the last chapter of the book of Jonah. Still, God has the last word regarding the black Assyrians of Nineveh. 
And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, which are more than six score thousand, that's 120,000 persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? See, the black Assyrians did not have access to Old Testament law or to the prophets that the Jews did. Thus, God had a more merciful attitude towards them. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus mentions the black Assyrians of Nineveh in Matthew and in Luke. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And we see similar words in Luke. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. And as in uh, Matthew, Jesus uses black people as a good example to his chosen people, the Jews. Here's another black person. The queen of the south, that's the queen of Sheba, shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Then Jesus mentions the men of Nineveh again. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, why did God send a Jewish prophet to black Assyrians, but not to any white people on the planet? That's God's business. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you like my information, my Facebook page is Dr. Deborah 7 p.m. S A T E S T. My YouTube channel is The Gospel of the Kingdom, period. My webpage is drdebrahbooks.com. And if you'd like to contribute to my GoFundMe page, the name of it is Publish the Black Sons of Abraham. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on my Facebook page. Amen. That way you won't miss a single video. Please like, share, and make comments on these videos, especially if you learned anything from the scriptures. For any of my four free books titled How to Read the Bible, it's only 19 pages or the gospel of the kingdom and this is a catechism of question and answer regarding the kingdom that jesus preached so if you want more information or if you want a relationship with god like the people in the bible had just read this free book and follow the instructions and another book that I have written, Time Out for the Reprobate Saint, if you don't understand evil people in the church and uh, you want a great understanding of the different types of people in the church, you can download this free book. The artwork is by the late Eric Dinkins and Ariel Echovaria. And... The Black Sons of Abraham is the book that I want to have published. I also want to have it edited, and I have a lot of color pictures in it. And uh, it's about um, uh, Abraham, who was pictured here after Sarah died. In Genesis 25, 1 and 2, he marries a black woman called Keturah. And he has six sons. So this is Ishmael over here. 
uh, Abraham's son by the black Egyptian woman Hagar, and these are his six sons by Keturah, another black woman. So I traced them through the Bible, and then I included all the men in the Bible who are mixed with Jewish and Hamitic blood. And uh, all of these books are available for free on my website, Dr. Deborah books.com and this beautiful artwork was done by Darian Greer amen so maybe you'll join me next week as I plan to discuss black people in the Bible for at least a few months and Lord willing my next video in this series of 12 black people will be titled 12 black tribes in the Bible part Four. And after that, I might return to the Faithful Midianite series. Blessings in Jesus' sweet name.